Right, so we're being very punctual at 7.30 on the dot. Um, so um, to, to everyone who's joined us this evening, good evening. Um, and welcome to our architecture workshop webinar with Asa Bruno. My name is Maya Binkin, and I am one of the team at Newlands House Gallery here in Petworth. Um, we opened just over a year ago with our space, which is 7,500 square feet. Um, and we host an exhibition program of contemporary art, photography, design, and architecture. Our current exhibition celebrates the work of Ron Arad, and we're delighted to have some of his beautiful pieces on display in our galleries. The exhibition will continue until March, and once the second wave is over with, uh, with the confinement, we really do hope to welcome you all in our galleries. Um, you can see more information about our exhibition on um, our website. Though this evening, we are really very happy to welcome um, Asa Bruno, um, and you, we very much hope that you will benefit from his years of experience working with Ron Arad. Um, Asa is an incredibly accomplished architect, and he has, some, um, he has worked on some iconic buildings um, around the world, um, and we're very grateful to him today for his time. Um, we will have some time at the end um, of the talk um, for a Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, please do pop them um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I will now hand over to Asa. So um, thank you very much again and over to you. Thank you very much, Maya. And uh, thanks to everyone at uh, Newlands House Gallery for inviting me to speak tonight and to all of you listening from uh, around the world. I would have normally very much liked to have, um, you know, speak to you in a physical event where we could have an informal chat afterwards and uh, maybe discuss some of the projects that I'll be showing tonight. But uh, given that we're on the eve of, uh, of a second lockdown, we have to make the, the, the most of this uh, event and, um, and I hope to, to give you a clear and hopefully informative and nuanced view of, uh, of the work that we do in the studio. So um, perhaps I shall share the screen and the presentation and uh, we'll start from there. So bear with me one second. I need permission to share my screen, please. So while I'm waiting for permission, perhaps I'll uh, mention a few words. Um, I've called this, uh, here we go. I've called this uh, talk um, uh, Two Decades. And I uh, hope you can see the screen. Um, this is really a uh, very concise review over the next 40 minutes or so of uh, some of our recent and current uh, works in the architectural studio. And I'd like to maybe mention a few words about the background and how I've come to spend 20 years with uh, um, Ron Arad uh, in his studio. Um, uh, we were introduced through a mutual friend uh, in the summer of 2000, um, Daniel Charney. Um, I walked through a alleyway uh, in Chalk Farm in North London. This is the gate to our alleyway. Uh, it's the same alleyway that would lead any visitor to the studio um, today. And through this alleyway, you reached uh, a set of stairs that lead up to this uh, studio. And the studio has been, you know, over the years called anything from a playground for grown-ups to a um, favela to an Aladdin's cave and it's, it's, it's all of these things in a way. Um, it's a creative environment uh, in, the, in the true sense of the word. It's messy, it's chaotic, it's, um, it sometimes leaves me with a desire for organized shelves and organized desks uh, but at the same time there's something about the energy of the place that's very conducive to making interesting things and, and, and Kind of playing with them and testing them and challenging them. Um, there's not an empty corner in the studio that is free of some echo of a project that we've been working on. Um, as you probably all know, it's a multidisciplinary studio, so it involves uh, um, a department that uh, concentrates on studio pieces, museum pieces, industrial design, anything from barware, eyewear, um, product design for industrial manufacturing, and then high-end, very, very bespoke, single unique pieces that, uh, that uh, travel the world and sit in various collections, some of which you can see in uh, Petworth when you can visit the actual gallery. Um, 
I'd like to start with a project that's perhaps one of the most important for me personally, and that's the Design Museum Holon in uh, Israel. Um, I won't really give a, a case study today of every single project. It will be a review of maybe five or six projects. But I think in terms of their, uh, how this project sits in the project progression of, of time in the office, uh, it's quite pivotal for me personally. It's the, it's the first new built project um, that uh, we have built in the studio. So we, we uh, founded the architectural uh, side of the studio, Ronard Architects in 2008, um, and finished two projects in quick succession, 2009, 2010. Um, and Design Museum Holon is, is, is one of the kind of uh, cherries on top, if you like, of, of, of many years of effort to, to try and get a very special building off the ground. Um, you can see here some uh, early sketches that developed the idea, the, the thinking behind the project, a language of ribbons and how they uh, envelope and support a gallery up in the air. Uh, you have two galleries that are offset from one another. And it's not just the aesthetics of this or the way it was built or the materiality of it, which I'll discuss in slightly more detail in a minute, but it's, it's more about how the, the kind of germination of a project. So you have, um, in this case, a very small local authority um, not very wealthy, not very well known before, um, sits uh, south of Tel Aviv. It's a municipality-led um, uh, project, quite low budget. So we're, this project was built for 2,200 US dollars per square meter, including fees and a VAT. So extremely low budget for a museum. Um, and the challenge was how do you create something that's both iconic and interesting and uh, relevant to the location and relevant to the people living in the city, but, but, but also has this wider appeal as a, as a project of national significance, if you like. It's, a national, it's the first national museum dedicated to design in Israel. And from these sketches, you can see the transition on the, on the left-hand side is an is a organizational diagram of the, some of the, very, of the various key facilities within the museum. And on the right is a tender plan uh, just before uh, construction. So you can see that the transition from sketch to organizational diagram, kind of a, a massing diagram to the final uh, uh, plan is not, that doesn't require a, a, a leap of imagination. You can quite see the continuity quite uh, clearly there. Um, and again, this, this not being a case study, I want to kind of breeze through this quickly and go into um, a particular set of aspects to do with this project, which I, which I find particularly interesting. And I think if over the next four or five projects that I'll review, you, you can take with you one or two aspects from each, you will then by the end see a kind of continuum or, or a theme that runs across some of these projects. Um, so fast forward three or four years, and this is the, the finished uh, museum, uh, which opened um, some 10 years ago, uh, opened its doors. Um, it's quite interesting, we, it being our first new built pr project from scratch, we really wanted to challenge ourselves and challenge what can be done for this budget in this location. And the, the, the thinking behind it was why build a building that tries to look like something very particular or special and then has a cladding that does that job for you and then has innards within it. Uh, if we can create a structure that is both the building, it holds the galleries in place, what you see is the structure. And that led us to, to really uh, explore what we can do and, and push the limits of boundaries of this material of Corten steel. A few words on Corten steel, it's a man-made alloy um, that is, uh, um, uh, if you like, uh, it, 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 it corrodes but then self-protects itself from further corrosion. So it's very useful for, for, for structural uses. So for example, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is built of Corten. Uh, the, the United States headquarters of uh, the US Steel, uh, um, the cladding is built of Corten. It's a very, very strong structural steel alloy, uh, but has this amazing benefit of not corroding further like iron would, for example. But then we set ourselves a challenge of how to explore the richness of this corrosion and arrest its development, if you like, over four or five stages to create this palette of finishes that you see here, this kind of very rich, fiery palette. So each one of these ribbons continues and flies through the air unsupported. There are no columns in the building. It's, it's purely held by its own structural feet, if you like. 
Um, and this is not just uh, for the benefit of um, uh, you know, acrobatics, it's also both something that takes you through the journey, through the museum, uh, and also creates a kind of self-shading mechanism. So if you like, this is a fisheye view of the main courtyard that you come uh, through into the project. Um, and you can see the fast forward uh, time lapse of, uh, of a day, a summer day. It's worth mentioning in a few words that Israel, uh, as, as you may know, is a very hot country with 10 months of uh, in, incredible heat, um, uh, often exceeding 30 degrees centigrade. And uh, um, we had the restrictions of the budget that I mentioned, but also the restrictions of space. So the entire uh, a museum it, uh, does not exceed 40,000 square feet or, or 3,700 uh, square meters, roughly. And within that, uh, very, very humble uh, uh, area for a museum, we wanted to capitalize on that. So that's hence the expansion upwards, hence the use of outdoor, indoor spaces that the structure can then shade and protect for those hot months. So, so really, from our point of view, the challenge was not just to create an iconic building and to, you know, something you could put on a stamp, as the client said, but also something that could really uh, challenge what could be done with a modest budget in a hot country with a small footprint. Um, so that's the kind of theme to take with you, if you like. And, and, and this lends itself also to the way the gallery works. So these are it's a night, uh, 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 an evening shot on the left and a daylight shot on the right, um, where you can see uh, two separate exhibitions um, since the museum opened. Um, and you can see the very few artificial light spots uh, in the ceiling. It's all uh, naturally lit. And this being a design museum, the way that natural daylight falls on and around three-dimensional objects is something we really, really wanted to celebrate. And um, we used uh, a very affordable, cheap, in other words, uh, um, mechanical device used usually in uh, greenhouses to create a uh, modulation that can darken the gallery or lighten the gallery, allow, allow natural daylight into the gallery. And that means that over those 10 months of daylight, you could really use very little electricity to light these exhibitions. Um, here you can see some of the lab testing of the uh, finishes that I mentioned before. So again, you can't fight Corten. Corten will do what it wants to do as a material. It will continue corrode continuously. But we looked at ways of impregnating the Corten with pigments. And we, uh, you can see the, this lab is in Milan. It's the uh, very beautifully named Institute of Grease and Oil of the Polytechnic in Milan, and they specialize in finishes usually for the car industry. And we use their services to develop this uh, particular finish. So it's not a coating, it's not a gloss, uh, it's not oven baked, it's, it's a bit like soaking a toast in uh, butter or, or, or a stain, if you like. Uh, so the pigment goes into the depth of the metal and stays there. And you have to repeat this process over several years in decreasing frequencies. And that gives you this overall very rich, fiery finish that, uh, that I showed before. It was, so uh, and that touches on another theme that's very dear to our hearts and also to uh, Ron uh, and the studio's work for many, many years, which is to respect what materials can do. So you push them, sometimes you push them to breaking point, but you really want to work with the material. You don't want to force it to do something else, to look like something else or hide the real material with another material just to make it look like something. So we really try and work with materials with their integrity, if you like. Um, fast forward a few years um, to a small project. Um, again, I'm gonna, this is just a, a single slide to show that sometimes themes come in, in clusters. Um, and the language of ribbons is a way, perhaps architecturally, to take a very large mass like a museum or like some larger projects that you will see um, uh, further on in the, in the talk um, and then translate it into smaller component uh, elements that enable you a to read scale in a particular way but also to uh, develop a three-dimensional envelope in a particular way so so by using the same sectional ribbons in this case uh, this is a house in Tokyo um, same section same height ribbons but their, their uh, transition from one another creates the definition of different floors, different entrances, different cutaways. Uh, and again, if you like, it's an echo of, of, of the language of ribbons from the design museum. 
Um, perhaps the most, uh, the largest project that uses a similar language is a project we, we finished in uh, Liège in Belgium. Liège used to be the capital of Belgian uh, steel production and uh, has, like many industrial towns in the early 21st century, started kind of coming down uh, both economically and as a result socially in terms of its standing compared to its heyday. Uh, and the, the, the very dynamic mayor, again, uh, similar to Holon, decided to invest in architecture as a catalyst for development of an awareness kind of in a wider uh, reach, if you like. Uh, and various, various uh, well-known architects were commissioned uh, from Dominique Perrault to Calatrava to create various uh, uh, landmarks within the city. We were invited to design a this is a very early sketch by Ron, by the way. We were, designed, we were invited to design a shopping mall, a retail center, uh, very, very long, 350 meters long, the, the length of the mall, uh, that would celebrate this heritage of steel. And it sits uh, by the river, uh, the, the shopping mall, and it, it straddles two main roads by a bridge and, a, and, a, and a, uh, two entrances either end. So it's like a snaking structure, if you like. And it really took the form of a Chinese lantern or, or some, some woven fabric made of strands, not dissimilar to the strands in Holon or in the project in Tokyo that I showed. Um, these are the, uh, a structural model, uh, images of a structural model of, that, of, of this uh, snaking structure from both ends. And it's worth mentioning perhaps in the context of how how one commissions architects in, in, in the 21st century. That this is the first project we've done that is almost a uh, precursor to BIM, to building information modeling, um, in that we didn't produce any drawings. So, so the, the, the hallmark of the architect, the classic kind of cliched view of the architect with a roll of paper under their arm, didn't exist here. We had produced seven or eight or nine drawings that were needed for statutory purposes, for applying for permits. Uh, but that's really a rubber stamping exercise. The project in its, entire, in, in, in its entirety sorry, was developed in three-dimensional uh, modeling from our studio to the engineering studio, uh, Bureau Happold, who worked on it, uh, through to uh, production of uh, steel schedules and drawings, and then uh, uh, production and assembly on site. So, here you see some of the images of this, again, woven ribbons of steel. These are welded into hollow tubes of steel that create both the stiffness and the language of the, the form of this sometimes single height, sometimes double height space. So that, that's uh, kind of a trio of projects, if you like, that, that look at how structure becomes envelope, uh, becomes a, a way of expressing scale and expressing that then, then let's say dynamism of, of the form that we want to create. And th this really kind of reveals in this particular case, not just an avenue for you to shop in left and right, but also views towards the city, towards the river, connection with the space that you're inhabiting, the fact that it's almost like a, no a long snaking road that bridges across other roads. Um, this leads me to the next project, which is uh, certainly the largest project uh, we have ever been involved in. We're still involved in it. Um, it's a two-phase project. It's called Toha. Uh, that's the marketing name. It is uh, based in Tel Aviv. Uh, it's worth mentioning in a few words that uh, Tel Aviv uh, has over the last, uh, certainly the last couple of decades, but really in, in recent years become um, something of a high-tech uh, um, uh, node, kind of globally, kind of a very, very central powerhouse for the tech industry outside of California. Uh, and many of the research and development uh, offices of, of some of the largest firms from Google to Microsoft to uh, Amazon, uh, et cetera, are, are headquartered in and around Tel Aviv. Uh, so it's a city, it's a relatively small city of half a million people, uh, but it has another half a million or 700,000 people commuting every day, which causes all sorts of uh, uh, traffic uh, problems, as you can imagine. But it means that it's this in inflation and deflation of the, of, the, of the working population of the city has placed quite a lot of demands, both in terms of office space and in terms of infrastructure. And uh, we were approached by a 
previously unprecedented size of a client, if you like, a joint venture between two giants, um, Amot and Bayside, they're called, the two companies, um, who together managed to uh, lease uh, uh, what is a very rarely available site in central Tel Aviv. So it's, a, it's a nearly two hectares in size, so 18,000 square meters or 200,000 square feet block in the middle of Tel Aviv. Very expensive, very rare. Uh, next to some pretty uh, main uh, traffic arteries and train stations and bus stations and future uh, light railway routes, which made it extremely attractive in terms of uh, its potential for uh, commuter access, and uh, commissioned us to, to come up with a very novel, very adventurous idea for what a campus for the high-tech industry could be in the 21st century. So we started, this is one of Ron's earlier sketches, uh, and you can see also in this uh, next sketch, the idea which we thought was quite uh, challenging uh, at the beginning was adopted wholesale by the client and then by the consultant team, which is to, to, to leave as much of these two hectares free as big, open, publicly accessible space, green space, green in the sense of actual trees, and make those giant buildings that occupy 2 million square feet, so 200,000 square meters of offices. Uh, that's the equivalent of nearly three times the Shard in London, just to, to, to give a notion of scale. Uh, and, and, and to put these on very stilt-like small legs that would, that would then free the, free the ground plane for the public and uh, enable us to really celebrate that volume up high. And the way to do this was to concentrate all the mechanical installations in these relatively small legs and free the roofs to become public spaces as well. So if you like, from, a, from the city's point of view, this was a very novel idea. Um, because we would take from the city 18,000 square meters, deliver 150 to 200,000 square meters of employment space, but then give the city back 20,000 meters of green space and roof space, publicly accessible space. So you give back a hell of a lot more than you take. Um, this is the kind of idea stage of how, how you envisage it, but then how do you make this happen, this very kind of brave uh, thinking process? And, and perhaps this comes from our, you could say, lack of experience or our thinking about things in a way that is not the usual, let's say, a responsible way of thinking about things uh, from a traditional architectural point of, of view of interpreting a brief. It's a very free way of thinking and, and, and it really takes a very brave client to, to, to adopt this kind of way of thinking. Um, so we then put this through the mill of looking at, uh, in this case, uh, the solar incidence analysis. So how that very strong sun in Tel Aviv hits the different facets of this facade, the 17 faceted strange uh, creature that you see here. That's the first phase of the project. Um, how we could use uh, the shelves, we call them, the, the slab extensions that come outside of the facade that enable it to both grow and shrink again in terms of profile, but create self-shading. So you see a building that uh, in the course of the day um, can, can shade itself and cool its own facades in a very traditional passive way without using uh, very expensive high-tech uh, high uh, devices. Um, this also prevents issues of reflectivity. So for example, if you're aware of, of uh, various projects in the world where there's a very uh, large fully glazed facade that then creates blinding or burning or all sorts of other um, uh, ill effects. So in this case you can see a comparison between a, a purely faceted treatment of this form on the left and a shelved, if you like, a stepped version of this on the right which completely uh, kills off any reflectivity issues. So th these are the kind of discussions we've had with the municipality, with the planners, to, to try and make sure that the, the project is really environmentally friendly in the widest possible uh, uh, meaning of the word. Of the word. Uh, on the left uh, is a wind tunnel uh, test model. Uh, all these little black markings are locations of little sensors that pick up uh, nuances and variations in wind as it's uh, sat in a wind tunnel, uh, very much like you would test a car. Um, to make sure we, we, we break the downdraft by using these shelves, we make sure we don't have uh, all sorts of wind corridors and uncomfortable areas on terraces, roofs, and uh, along the, uh, the feet of the building. Uh, and we also uh, use this to an analyze the way that you would 
disperse uh, rainfall. So, so this is a, an exaggerated scale, like a 10 scale, 100 scale, sorry, uh, rainwater uh, simulation, again, facet versus stepped. Because of the general dryness of Tel Aviv, you end up with scenarios where you will suddenly have six inches, 150 mil of rain in 24 hours or 48 hours, so like a dump of water. But then uh, the infrastructure that the plumbing and the drainage and the sewers can't really handle. So, so by dispersing it in a slightly more managed way uh, through the facade, there's a way of controlling this a bit better. A few more slides on, on how do we make, you know, how do we back up this, this idea of, of, of reversing the building, of putting it upside down, if you like. So what you see on the ground in and amongst those trees are these legs and those legs are mechanical in nature. So we wanted to treat them in a way that's pleasing architecturally, uh, but uh, still allows it, those legs to breathe. So if you look at those legs, uh, they are treated with what we call the X panels, which are simply an alternating set of panels that uh, allow the, fa the, the facade to breathe within the triangles that are left over between these panels. Uh, and th those panels really cover the, the, the lion's share of the building's plant, which you see here in this kind of x-ray view. Uh, and the idea is that when you then walk around the legs of the building, when you walk around the, the, the cores of the building, if you like, where it touches the ground, you don't look at a mechanical plant, some kind of, you know, a galvanized steel grill or something industrial. You see something that looks more like a woven, uh, texture of something that's very mineral and it's uh, characteristic. Uh, we used a, a material called Decton, which is made by Cosentino in Spain, which is entirely 100% uh, made of recycled stone powder. There's no adhesive in it, so it's very environmentally friendly. It's compressed at an incredible pressure and temperature to create these very inert panels. They don't absorb dirt. They don't discolor in UV radiation, and they allow us to have this very rigid, crisp mineral feel to it. So these are renders, and then we go to photographs of the finished uh, facades. You can see the transition on the right-hand side. You can see a transition from these X panels to normal facade, uh, uh, office facades uh, that, that travel up the building. And the closer you are to the building, the more you can see those ridges of the original uh, geometry, this kind of iceberg-like or geological um, uh, overall form or, or of the mass of the building. One of the other features is, of course, these shelves create a sense of scale. So you can look at this building and see that it's enormous. You know, it's 600,000 square feet, phase one, 50,000 square meters or more. And yet you can, you can look at it and immediately understand what the scale of a person is within that very large uh, volume. Um, some close-ups of these uh, X panels again. Um, and, and, and of course, one of the partners, if you like, in this project is the landscape itself. So it's not just the mass that the architect comes and imposes upon a city to resolve these uh, briefs. It's also how does it touch the ground? And we, we, we took great care to, to try and rethink the convention of having a commercial podium on top of which you have a tower, which, which you see everywhere around the world. Uh, it, it tends to satisfy the, the need for uh, generating uh, income on the ground, but with a very gentle decline in, in uh, uh, shopping generally around the world, in shopping malls and in shopping centers, and this, not to mention what's, uh, what's happened to this world very sadly uh, this year, um, we decided to also challenge how this meets the ground, not via commercial podium. And that's where these legs come into this. And, uh, and, and our partner here is the landscape. So as I mentioned before, we're surrounded by trees. We, we are in the process of planting a total of something like 400 mature trees within the landscape around the tower. Um, and it's very much uh, something that, that, that follows you as you look out the windows and as you approach the building from up, up close. And by, by having this bridge or these, the, these cores as uh, naked legs going up to the sky, it means you have views through the landscape. It's not a big, solid mass of concrete that lands on the ground. A few words on the lobby itself. So the, the building benefits from a huge atrium that uh, uh, travels through the entire height of the building, uh, over 100 meters, 330 feet. 
Um, this serves the purpose of both bringing natural daylight into every office in the building, so it's not that there are no dark corners in the building. Again, this creates a massive saving in electricity for office spaces and also is a very good, uh, a gentle quality of daylight uh, throughout all the offices and the shelves help create just enough shading so you don't have this blinding effect within the offices. Of course, there are blinds as well that you can drop down for comfort and especially in the afternoon hours, but generally speaking, the building really tries to, to make good use of the climate. You can just about see a very fine fritting or, or uh, printed pattern on the glazing on either sides of the atrium here that are uh, almost like in cars in the 60s create this kind of darkened um, uh, gradient from the top down. Um, it also, this atrium ser serves to flush the building of, of heat during the night and also create this amazing dynamic, this com almost community dynamic within the various office spaces uh, in the building. So, so you could be working in one office and uh, people post uh, post-its on the window and communicate with people who work across the atrium uh, in other offices. You can see here the atrium uh, during construction and just when it was starting to be populated on the right hand side. And it also means that the, even the cheapest, if you like, uh, office in the whole building, uh, which would normally be a kind of uh, uh, back street office in a normal office tower looking at a car park, for example. So here, the cheapest paying, uh, the cheapest rent paying office in this entire building has this view on the left. So it's inward facing into the atrium. It's 30 meters above street level. And it's looking down at this uh, very generous atrium and the plantation within the atrium that continues this kind of green wave that carries through. So again, we're not, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're trying to really question what could an environment that people come to work and spend more time than they do often with their families be? How can you make this a very special place to be, a special place to come to work in? Uh, the reception desk itself is, is, is sculptural. Uh, um, one of our clients is disabled uh, and in this project, and it was very interesting to try and put in practice what you preach and what you're preached to uh, from when you're a student all the way through your professional development of, of how inclusivity is so key and so fundamental to creating good buildings. And it's not just a slogan and it's not just a regulation. It's something that you really need to be conscious of and put, put the right effort to, to ensure that it exists in the, in the fullest sense of the word. So what we did here is in this papardelle of, of, of a reception desk, every single one of the paths of the speed gates that you can pass your car through and come into the building is of a width that can accept a wheelchair. So instead of having a back passage, a side passage, every person able-bodied or, or less than able uh, uh, can come through the main gates like everyone else and into the lifts. Um, even some of the more kind of blunt, let's say structural elements within the building. So for example, this what we call the south leg. So the building has three legs to kind of hold it uh, on its kind of L-shaped uh, uh, plan um, is, um, is something that we wanted to cloud in a, in a more engaging ornamental way, if you like. So, so we create this as a sketch of Ron's on the left and then uh, a kind of rationalization of that and then translation into a brass, patinated brass uh, facade that then again ages and uh, patinates through time. So the beauty of patinating materials is that they kind of have their own life and they, they kind of go through through this in a, in a way that, uh, that kind of uh, evolves over time. It's never a static thing. Yeah. Uh, birds coming, migrating birds coming to visit the project. This is the roof. Um, uh, and this is the kind of uh, the finished first, first phase of the building. So we're now working on phase two, which is a very tall younger brother to this uh, first phase. Uh, I can't yet show you uh, this project because it's under wraps, but uh, hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll be able to make a bigger <coughs> announcement about it. Um, I have two more projects to show you. I'll try and do this as quickly as possible. Um, this is a, again, a, another project in Israel very important for us. It's called Bet Shulamit, which means Shulamit House. You can see the title is in Arabic, English, and Hebrew. Uh, and the portrait is of uh, Mrs. Shulamit Katzman, the late Miss, Mrs. Katzman, the wife of the donor, the main donor who's donated funds for the creation of this hospital, who sadly died of cancer some five years ago. 
she was a doctor herself and a philanthropist uh, from uh, the United States. And um, one of the first things that, the, that this donor did, uh, her husband did, was uh, scout and, and map the, the entire healthcare map of Israel and allocate uh, uh, areas that, that, that were in need. And in this case, Afula, which is a town in the north of Israel, you can see very close to the borders of the Palestinian Authority, um, is, a, is a vacuum, a medical vacuum in terms of cancer care. So the idea is to create a dedicated cancer hospital, a uh, new built building that would serve uh, a very diverse population. So Palestinians from the north of the Palestinian Authority, uh, uh, autonomy uh, areas, people that live in kibbutzes nearby, uh, Jews, Christians from Nazareth, mu Muslims from villages and towns around, very diverse uh, ethnically in terms of religion, in terms of intake of patients and staff. Um, and we really wanted to champion this approach of, of looking at the need rather than at the funding. Uh, this funding could have been used very well in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or Haifa or any, any one of these cities. Uh, but it really has a, a, a very life-changing use in the periphery in this, in this particular area. Uh, we campaigned to choose a site that's outside of the main campus of the hospital in this uh, uh, wheat field, uh, just outside. Um, and again, I, I wanted to challenge the normal layer cake of a hospital, if you like. So on the left, you have a normal layer cake slice of a cancer hospital where treatment uh, would be below ground, and in, in this case, uh, radiotherapy, which generates uh, uh, radioactive uh, um, energy and particles, so it has to be contained and shielded, and that, that's why it's usually put underground. Uh, and then you have the public and outpatients on ground floor with easy access, and then inpatients who can uh, en enjoy the privacy they need are higher up and then service and mechanical plants on the roof. So that's a traditional kind of section of a hospital ward, if you like, and we wanted to break this, if you look on, on the right-hand slides, and use the topography of the site to maybe bring some daylight into this treatment area. So when you come in, you have cancer, you're very frail. If, you are, um, if part of your treatment is radiotherapy, um, then you will have to spend quite a lot of time in this very dark area normally. And we wanted to make this as, again, open and daylit as possible. And part of that uh, approach led us to really spread out the building as much as we can with these promontories that hug different gardens. So this is a very early sketch. Um, and another sketch that shows the, uh, um, the layering of this hospital and how it would feed and blend into the... Uh, uh, in, into the uh, environment around it. So, as I said, there's a gentle topography, these, these uh, uh, wheat fields, and the ability to create, the, the wish to create these pocketed gardens that from every location within the hospital, every patient, every member of staff would always be looking at gardens, not at mechanical plants, not at car parks, but at this amazing uh, landscape. So, landscape here from our point of view, is at least 50% of the project. And we're working with uh, Studio, Studio Urbanov, a very uh, talented uh, young landscape architectural uh, studio in Israel. Um, and it, it's really about identifying programmatically what is necessary for palliative care, what is necessary for patients who are very frail, who cannot uh, potentially move or could, could use alternative therapies within uh, the garden, if they're able to reach certain parts of this garden, so it's about mobility and accessibility, uh, scent, smell, um, and especially views all around. Um, and we're using uh, a variation, a variety of plants uh, from the region uh, that that really kind of work with the season, you know, seasonally uh, and ecologically with this kind of very uh, uh, varied uh, terrain. Uh, here are some uh, 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 timber models, wooden models of the, of the hospital, which uh, broke uh, ground uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, you can see some more views here, again, showing how from every angle, even from the main lobby, you would be looking out onto those uh, gardens. Um, part of the, and, and again, I'll just, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this. It's a very important feature of the hospital is the fact that we have created these, uh, if you like, it's an echo of the shelves I showed in the previous project. In this case, these canopies. And this is a 
diagram that shows the shadow puddle diagram, if you like, of the hospital. So where would you need the most shading to protect the, the people inside the hospital from being uh, blinded by the glare of the light? Um, it's worth mentioning that people who undergo chemotherapy in particular sometimes experience changes to the sensitivity of light that they experience and the transition from the harsh uh, internal artificial light to the dark shadows outside or vice versa can be very disorientating and un uncomfortable. So we wanted to really fray and, and, and make the edges of the hospital boundaries a bit more fuzzy. So by mapping the shadows and compensating for where we have glare points with the reach of the canopies, we developed a language of these uh, struts that hold these canopies and then developed this language of the canopies as a, as a kit of parts that you could assemble. And those create this transition of shadows around the building that enable patients to walk around and enjoy both the spaces within the hospital and immediately outside of it without being blinded by glare. And again, it's made of a very, a very simple set of components that then create this frayed fabric-like shadow effect, if you like, on the ground. Um, and I, it's always a balance between the ambition to create something very meaningful and very effective, but that has to be affordable. And again, while half the donation is from a, a private uh, donor, half of the funds come from a, from a national health service provider who don't have unlimited funds. So you have to kind of find a way to make these things happen. Um, this echoes the way we light uh, some of the internal spaces um, and we also looked at how we could uh, have uh, a change to, to how traditional patient rooms are arranged. So in this case you have a, a two patient room with a, a bed diagonally across from each other so people can have both the privacy they want if they want to close the curtain but also have a conversation with each other if they want to instead of lying next to each other with their backs against the same wall which would mean cricking your neck to have a conversation with a fellow patient. Um, and it's about, again, with a relatively low budget, creating a, a, a slightly more domestic feel to these rooms instead of this very clinical, cold, uh, the usual uh, feeling that you get. Um, the treatment areas, these clusters of, of treatment areas in the outpatient ward where patients would come to receive uh, injections, uh, chemotherapy treatment for anything between two hours and six, seven hours, have to have a range of, of, of facilities for comfort purposes, but also the ability to then open up these curtains, have a conversation with your fellow patient around you, and of course have these wide sweeping views of the landscape through the facades. And uh, this, this is about uh, eight months old or nine months old because I haven't been able to visit the site, so it's quite out of date, but you can see uh, construction uh, commencing and underway. And uh, that is due to receive its first patient in less than two years from now. So I'm very excited about that personally. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of this fantastic team, both here and locally, that are working on, on this very inclusive and diverse uh, reach of a project. I'd like to finish with a very uh, topical project. Topical in the sense that uh, it's uh, in the news quite a lot uh, nationally uh, and a little bit internationally, actually, recently. Um, this is the, these are the Houses of Parliament here in London. Um, and this uh, green stretch of trees that you see just to the left, which is to the south of the Houses of Parliament, are called Victoria Tower Gardens. This is the site that a commission, a government commission, uh, in 2016 decided to dedicate to the creation of the first UK National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre. Um, and we were, uh, we applied for, uh, to participate in this international competition uh, that saw some hundred entries or so from, from around the world that kind of uh, got through the, the very uh, demanding uh, entrance bar, if you like, for the competition. And we were then selected as part of the shortlist and then uh, won the competition in uh, 2017 and have been working on it ever since. Uh, it's topical because it is in this location, it is this subject matter. Um, it, in some ways it couldn't be more important, but at the same time it, 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 it is controversial because of the decision to locate it in this location. And uh, while we understand the complexity of of, of taking a garden, a, taking a public space that's existing and has existed, existing in various forms for hundreds of years in central London by the River Thames next to the House of Parliament and putting into it something that 
uh, is of, of great uh, gravity and importance um, is a very brave decision on behalf of the government. And we, we applauded them, but we had a very, uh, a, a very big challenge to rise to, if you like. So the, the, the way we decided to address this project is by looking at it again as, as, a, as a dialogue between the site as a landscape and the site as a location for the placing of important architecture, meaningful architecture. And in this uh, early sketch of, of Rons from 2016, you can see the length of the gardens and uh, these little triangles or, 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 or like almost like flames that are slowly rising from, the, from, the, from this ground swell uh, in the ground, this landform on the south side of the site. Uh, and this little white pyramidal structure there that you see is an existing uh, memorial in the, in the park. There are, there are various other small sculptures and memorials in the park, uh, which really lend itself to the, to, to the notion of a garden of remembrance or, or a garden that, that offers a sequence of memorials that are a stance against injustices. Um, Emmeline, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst Memorial, uh, the Suffragette, uh, Burgers of Calais uh, by Rodin is one of the other, uh, other sculptures there, and this is the Buxton Memorial uh, to, the, to the Parliamentarian Act of Abolition of Slavery. And there's another memorial uh, a bit further south, the Spicer Memorial. So we decided to, to take this, this long strip of, of, of grass uh, and lawn uh, by the river and to really look at how we could position a memorial as far south as possible to leave as much of the park uninterrupted and, 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 and really uh, the, the sentence that we spoke about um, amongst the team and the, the team comprises uh, our team in charge of the memorial, uh, Ajay Associates in charge of the uh, overall master plan and the learning center that's below ground and Gustafson Porter and Bowman landscape architects who've done a fantastic job of, of putting this all together in terms of how the landscape both covers the memorial and becomes part of it and uh, becomes the canvas for the larger project. Uh, and the idea is really that as a visitor to the park, you could still enjoy the park just very much as it is, but you will see on the horizon these little uh, blades or fins uh, uh, made of bronze that just give a hint of this upheaval underground. And this notion of the upheaval is very much at the heart of, the, of this concept for the memorial. It's not an object on a plinth, it's not a sculpture uh, per se, it's, it's, a, it's an upheaval. It's, a, if you like, a metaphor for what happens when uh, bubbling uh, uh, persecution and hatred uh, uh, are left unchecked in a democracy um, and can erupt and create uh, uh, and can wreak havoc upon communities. This memorial, it's very, very important to mention, is, is, is uh, declared as a memorial to the Holocaust and to all victims of the Holocaust. Uh, and to Nazi persecution. So we, we, we did not want to adorn it with any pictographic symbols like a Star of David or wording in Hebrew. We wanted to make it abstract and visceral as an experience. So it's something you experience first. It, it grab, grabs you first from the stomach and then from the mind. As you go through this memorial physically as, an, as a temporal experience, you then come down underground into the learning center where you would learn more and, and get the didactic content that accompanies this experience. And this, this rise in the landform really offers the park itself a new experience, a new raised vantage point from which to look at the river, uh, to look at the House of Parliament, um, to meander around the memorial, various memorials in the park, and really see these uh, fins uh, uh, kind of punctuate and puncture the ground and give you just hints of what's to come. And it's only when you cross this threshold that you see here on the left and turn around and this is a view from the river, do you realize that these, the, this crown of, of fins on the horizon of this landform are actually a cliff-like geological uh, uh, mass um, that is more daunting and, uh, and perhaps unsettling. And as you come full circle, you realize that these are, in fact, a series of fins that you are encouraged to walk in between in single file. And there are, I, I won't, uh, I, again, this is not a case study, so I won't, uh, you can find out a lot more about this project online, but um, the, the notion here, there are many symbolic underpinnings and many narratives that are woven into it. But the, if you have to take one uh, element from this, it's the idea that 
you can only as a visitor walk through these, these paths alone. You can't experience this as a group of people holding hands, walking together and chatting about what you're, what you're seeing or what you're experiencing. This breaks apart couples, families, groups into individuals that have to go down these paths uh, by themselves and experience this by themselves. And of course, there are ramps and a lift and uh, staircases for, for different uh, abilities. But the idea is that you have this singular experience that you, you walk alone and you reach down into the threshold space below ground from which you would then enter the learning center. And uh, this is where all these paths funnel into. So if you like, it's another analogy to the fact that you can make your choices, but the, your fate is absolute uh, and you have very little control over it uh, as this uh, is the case. Um, th this project is a celebration of um, materiality as well and the fact that this is made of bronze, will be made of bronze hopefully uh, if it gets built. Um, and I will mention this in one more word. Um, and it's the way it is patinated naturally. It's the way that people record the passage of time by just running their hands on it. It's the sound it makes when you knock on it. It's the sound that come in from the content from the learning center that emanates through these paths. And it's the reflection of the color of the sky and the trees and the clothes that people wear in these crumpled stainless steel ceiling sofas that you see above these paths. So all of these come together to create this experience. Um, this is currently in a very, um, very fascinating, uh, intense uh, public inquiry, which is currently underway. It's, in, it's three weeks into a five week public inquiry at the highest level of um, uh, planning in this country. And it will be determined uh, by, the, uh, by Her Majesty's Inspectorate uh, and given a recommendation to the Secretary of State, the minister in charge of uh, deciding, having the final say about this project. So we're very hopeful that the decision will be made to approve this, which we will hopefully know by the end of this year. And then if this is the case, then it will be built uh, commencing next year. Um, and that's it. I would like to end on this uh, slide and I will stop sharing my screen now. And I would be very happy to answer any questions you might have or any other comments. Thank you. I think I've taken a few minutes extra. You have, but that's absolutely fine. This is me again. Thank you so much, Asa. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I loved that you um, sort of see the landscape as one of your partners. Um, and um, I'll be very curious to see what happens at the end of the public inquiry. Um, I was particularly moved, um, I must admit, by your Betula Meat um, uh, project. I think that it's a really beautiful thing uh, to see. Um, being made and the sensitivity, sensitivity and the consideration that you've been putting into the purposes of, of the building is really very touching. So, so um, I'll look forward to um, seeing that as well um, when it's built. Um, we have um, a few questions in the Q&A, um, which um, I'll just read out um, to you. Uh, and I am, we'll start with a um, question from Anonymous. Um, a lot of people have decided to remain anonymous, but I like this question. Um, which is, um, which building, um, what building do you wish you could have worked on? So this is sort of a personal, a personal favorite for you. Um, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a question that I'm sure anyone who is, you know, anyone who's creative is asked a question about in their field of creativity, what would be their, you know, the greatest art commission or musical, uh, composition, or in this case, a building, I would say, um, there's something about uh, sound that really fascinates me. And I think we, we, were, we were nearly involved in the design of a concert hall uh, some years ago. And for various reasons, that didn't uh, end up happening. Mm -hmm. So I would say if, if I had a choice of what would be the next project to work on, I would say a concert hall. I think the challenges of, again, marrying the qualities of sound, the ability to be within your own head and, and uh, absorb that experience and at the same time be part of a group of people who are enjoying a performance and the language of that space and the topology of that space is something really, yeah. really challenging and interesting. So I would say that, that would be my favorite thing to design. Um, well, I hope, I hope you get the opportunity to do, to do that one day. Um, do you worry how a building will look um, as they age? Is that something that sort of worries, worries you as an architect? Yes, I th again, I, th I think that's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. And I, th I think um, if I may kind of 
say so. I think not enough architects worry about how buildings will age. And I think we, we see this all around us when we walk around. And in fact, we have a, I think a very nostalgic, passionate love for old buildings of a certain era or eras because they age uh, very well or very romantically, if it's a ruin or, or very well, if it's a kind of a monolithic uh, stone structure, for example. But a lot of modern materials don't age very well and buildings do, li do look dated sometimes two years after they're finished, sometimes 20 years after they're finished. So I, I think it's something we do worry about a lot. And I think part, part of the reason why we have been looking at materials that are not traditionally used externally, let's say, so uh, like Corten steel, which, which you, you do see quite a few buildings uh, clad in Corten, but it's not conventional, it's not the traditional uh, finish of a building. Uh, or bronze in the case of the memorial, uh, or copper in the case of some of the louvers in the hospital, which I didn't mention, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or, or, or the, the decton material that I mentioned in terms of the office tower. These are all materials that are there exactly because we worry about how they would look like over time. And sometimes we want them to be very inert, like Decton, and sometimes we want them to age radically, like the design museum, where you want it to kind of go wild and rusty and red. So, so it is something that we, we worry about a lot, but worry in, a, I would say, in a positive sense of the word. Um, I've got a few uh, questions which are quite sort of uh, specific um, to the projects that you were um, mentioning. Um, we've got one question um, asking, what was the material of the internal atrium in the Tel Aviv Telha building? So we have uh, a number of materials there. Um, if you recall, there's a, there's a kind of a light well-like space in the atrium that goes all the way up so that the higher reaches are all glazed because there are office spaces looking into the atrium. But the lower reaches, we have a stepped uh, facade, internal facade made of timber, and that's American walnut over black uh, laminate, uh, shiny laminate, and it means you have a bit of reflectivity there. So when you go and wait for your lift, you see a silhouette of yourself. Uh, split into lines of, uh, of walnut, so it's kind of warm, but also quite playful. Uh, opposite that, we have a wall that goes 105 meters high vertically, and it looks like a barcode, if you like, and that's all uh, precast concrete um, uh, panels that are kind of randomized, so it just looks like a, like a very disrupted vertical surface. Um, and we have acoustic panels, which are kind of bushy black material on the underside of these big beams that you saw there to absorb some of the sound mm -hmm. bounces around. So, so concrete, walnut, laminate, and stripes of bronze as well. Nice variety. Uh, we have a question from Melina, um, who's asking, um, have you used solar, a solar pal panel system in the health project in, in Israel? So, so in uh, the next... So yes, yeah, so, so the, um, as I mentioned in that layer cake slide, we've tried to keep a lot of the kind of noisy, dirty um, uh, side of the, of, of the mechanical plant away from the roof for, for a variety of reasons. A, because it's, uh, um, it, it tends to be very large because it has to have overcapacity because of the heat in Israel. Mm -hmm. So by putting it covered, it tends to be smaller because it's cooler and shaded. So we took a lot of the stuff away from the roof and into an interim floor within the hospital. And that freed a lot of the roof to become solar, um, uh, kind of PV panels and solar panels. Uh, so, so we generate a lot of the, uh, for example, hot water and electricity uh, for the lighting and for the irrigation, et cetera, uh, on site on the building itself, because it's got a, a 10,000 square meter roof almost. Um, Toha 2, just to, another little comment there, Toha, the phase two of the Toha tower, Mm -hmm. uh, will have the largest amount of PV panels in a single building uh, in the country. Yeah. So we're, we're looking to, uh, we received the highest rating of uh, environmental certification for the phase one, which is lead platinum. And we're looking to do that as well in, in, in phase two. And we're going to generate a lot of electricity uh, in situ, which is quite hard in an office building. Very happy to hear that. Uh, Philip is asking, how wide are the paths of the memorial in London? So That's a very specific question. They're, they're 1.2 meters. So they are, they are wider than the minimum required for health and safety reasons and safety reasons, but they are, they are just wide. So it's not really comfortable to walk side by side. So, so anybody can hold uh, and touch both sides of the wall. Uh, 
but and it, it's it's just narrow enough we believe to create quite a daunting feeling so it's that that fine line between being very comfortable uh and between the sense of trepidation walking down because it's a very unusual feeling to walk down a canyon almost mm -hmm. that's 20 meters long one meter 20 wide and stepped and descending under these six seven eight meter high bronze walls so it's quite a quite a intense uh, feeling um we've got a question here um which i think might um, answer quite a few of, of the questions um uh, which was posed again by anonymous who's asking how challenging is it to develop a conceptual sketch by ron arad dot 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 um that's one of the it's one of the funnest uh, part of fu funnest if that's a word part of the of the work in the studio is that um the studio is quite small i didn't mention this before the studio is quite small we've never been more than 23 people in the studio so we've been as few as 12 and as many as 23 and that's the kind of size of it because Ron never wanted to become a big office where he has no knowledge of the particulars of a particular project or is not involved in that way. So Ron is very involved and it's not, it's not just an invol involvement that starts with a sketch and then that gets handed over. Mm -hmm. it, it, the sketch is really the language of work in the studio. So, so any, anyone uh, that works with Ron on any project, be it a, a, a eyewear or, or a, a chair or a building, the dialogue evolves around sketching. So this has been a challenge in recent months doing it via Zoom or Teams, but it's, it's certainly something that we, we do quite a lot. And, and Ron uh, would sketch first freely, then for example, we would generate a preliminary model in 3D as a response to that sketch. We would share that with Ron, Ron would sketch over that again. So it's an iterative process. That means that, that both the person leading a project, in this case, architectural project, myself, for example, and Ron have a constant uh, finger on the pulse of what happens with the design. So you can, you can say this, this iter iterative pro process with sketching ensures that the building isn't too far from the first concept on one hand, and then again, that it's rigorous enough as a building to, to work as a building and be buildable. Um, I've got a very specific question from Calvin, which I hope might answer some of the other questions as well. In your opinion, what software do you mostly use for conceptual design leading to the structural designs? Um, so it's kind of specifically what software do you use? I, 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 I'd like to you know, come clean. I'm not sponsored by any software. <laughs> I should have thought of that. Um, um, we've used lots of different software packages over the years. So, so, for example, when I started working in the office, we used Maya. Maya, um, uh, which is traditionally used for animation rather than uh, careful modeling or precise modeling in our architectural terms. And that's because it allows you this freehand form finding and form shaping. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that a bit less these days and we use Rhino, which is a very common platform that's used by many, many practices because it's, it's open source code it means that lots of people write lots of plugins for it. Some of these plugins become very successful, like Grasshopper, that then becomes subsumed into the package and enables you to do parametric modeling. Uh, the same goes for rendering, the same goes for uh, uh, other aspects of the creative process. But I think Ron, for example, only uses either a, free ha either a 6B pencil on a pad or a uh, painting software. So like a light pen on a tablet, sketch, we would look at it, we would, uh, uh, I, I would sometimes sketch, someone else might sometimes sketch. Uh, so it's still very much pen on pad or pen on paper. Uh, that then can be transmitted to various machines around the, the, the studio and picked up by whoever is working on that project and developed uh, as a 3D, 3D package. So in architecture specifically, we use uh, Revit, which is now the kind of uh, standard for construction documents, but not for creative modeling. It's too, it's too clunky and kind of... Um, uh, it's almost too rigorous for the creative process. We use other other uh, methods before we get to that point of like uh, the, the, the kind of final model, if you like. Well, that's some good practical advice for all you budding architects out there. Um, yes. I think we've got, uh, we're just running over time. Do we have time for two more questions? Would that be okay? For me, absolutely no problem. We've got one question, um, um, which is quite interesting, um, again from Anonymous saying, you mentioned the slow but inevitable decline of shopping in persons in our cities. Uh, due to online purchasing in what way do you anticipate architecture changing in our city centers as a response to this 
That's a that's a tricky one because we we have uh, as I, as I've shown uh, in the talk we we've been part of the uh, we've been part of the effort of designing shopping malls, mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time uh, shopping malls are seeing a gradual decline in footfall over over, over recent years, uh, and a lot of it is being taken over as, as um, Melina is saying by by online shoppers who just prefer in the comfort of their living room or bedroom to just click order. On, on anything from a, a necklace to a fridge to a bottle of wine to a you know to a car, um, so so the, the the need for physical space is changing. I don't think it's replacing it completely. I just think it's changing. So I, th I think uh, uh, from conversations with a few clients, let's say one of the more interesting for us as architects, one of the most more interesting horizons for looking at retail might be to create experience rather than storage shelves for objects. So it's, it's really more about uh, um, creating a place that you want to go to because you can get an experience you cannot get by looking at a 2D surface like we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really about, you know, it, the, the personal touch, the personal care. It's a bit like the fascination we now have. We're rediscovering with things that are unique and one-off and have tactility to them. So I think that will come back if we can afford it in, in, in various ways into the retail world. So um, our last question is going to be a very topical one, um, which is the COVID question, really. Um, has COVID affected? Uh, you mentioned that um, it, you've been finding it hard to, to work um, with your team, um, but do you see that it's affecting um, uh, the way that you're thinking about sort of buildings or, or sort of space management in the future? Yes, so, so I'll, I'll answer it in two parts and I'll, I'll try and be as concise as possible. The, the first part is to do with how do you as an architect work or how does an office operate in this, in this kind of uh, situation. We, we, none of us knew what we're heading into back in February. And by June, we could see inklings of coming out of it, but we now know that this is likely to be quite a rough cycle for the next few months at the very least. And this means that many, many offices have suffered a lot uh, throughout this process and have had to find very clever, quick solutions to weather the storm. Uh, and we, we have, uh, knock on wood, we've been quite fortunate in terms of the size, I think helped a lot in terms of adaptability. So we, we've moved into working remotely quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And we have daily and weekly sessions within the team and amongst other teams that we collaborate with because we're very small as i mentioned before it means we have to rely on other collaborations with other offices uh, and consultants around the world and and this platform like the one we're now using is very helpful for that mm -hmm. so in terms of communication it's very good it's very difficult for um you know the, again tactility the, the little social cues we get out of sitting in a room with someone uh, the little informal chats we have in corridors all, all of these things are kind of lost so we have to kind of find different ways to compensate for them. But that, that, that's on the pragmatic side of things. I think that pr pragmatic side of things is always easier to resolve. In terms of designing uh, um, spaces to, 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 or environments to, to kind of really address what, what we are now discovering is the new normal, um, I think the biggest challenge is to know how much of this will stay as a residue moving forward. So once we're over the worst of this COVID, mm -hmm. do we want to go back to what was there before exactly in the same way. Do we want to think about some halfway house? Uh, for example, you know, people have discovered they can spend, you know, more time with their families without killing each other. They discover that they have more time to do things that they enjoy doing because they can work in different hourly patterns during the day. Um, so there's a lot more. For, if we take the example of an office tower like the one I mentioned, the, the second phase of Toha, we're looking at the benefits of hot desking, the fact you don't have your own office, yeah. the fact that you can design an office so that it has an occupancy of uh, 120% except not at the same time. So it, it means that you, 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 you base the, the design on the fact that most of the people will be working at home or on the beach or on holiday for two hours of a day uh, and not actually physically at the office. And you, can, you can really try to think about the boundaries within the office, the way you access the office, how much space is given to traditional cubicles or open plan space, uh, as opposed to how it was taken before COVID. Okay, we'll see what, what the, where, where the future takes us. Um, Asa, thank you so much for your time um, and for putting together such a stimulating talk and um, hearing about um, all the wonderful projects you're working um, on with Ron Arad. 
Um, this is the first of a series of talks that we're um, going to be um, hosting as part of um, our activity at Newland House Gallery over November and December. So I hope that everyone will join us as we go back into lockdown. Um, with, uh, for some of our talks, um, we're going to have Ron Arad um, speaking next week with Sylvia Dania, uh, Damiani and uh, Diane Salchek. They're going to be talking about um, great design. Um, so I hope that you will all uh, join us. Uh, we also have Sir Anthony Gormley, Thomas Heatherwick, um, Sir Charles Summary Smith and um, Pierre Lagrange as some of the um, upcoming speakers. But you can find all the information about that on our website, uh, newlandshouse.gallery. Um, and you can register over there as well. So I will bid you all a very, very good evening. Thank you so much again, Asa. Thank you, thank you very much for attending. And, um, yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.